Okay, so this CBDB project we're working on at the core is an inventory tracking system. We're not there at that point yet to be able to save meaningful information. We've created the login and logout system. Well, to save that information, well, backing up, what have we used so far to save simple bits of data in our project so far? Local storage. Local storage. So it saves kind of like a cookie. It's about five megabytes per cookie. And it saves simple amounts of information. We're going to use more complex um, bundles of information, uh, which would require a type of a database. So we're going to work with uh, a database. Um, next month we'll get into it much more detail. I think I've mentioned it already, but if you'd like to make a note and look at this on your own, we'll do it into much more detail, of course. Later on we're going to use this database called PouchDB. Databases can run in a variety of ways, for example, off of a server or not. Traditionally, you run a database off a server. You have the MySQL database, MySQL database running off a server. You have SQL, you have Oracle, you have uh, what other databases? Uh, FoxPro, I guess, Access. Um, you have these databases often running off of a server, MySQL being one of the most popular ones. But those often need a server, a computer on the internet that your app can connect to to save the data. This is the kind of a database uh, in a newer generation called a NoSQL style database. It doesn't need to run off of a server. It actually runs off right off of the device. So on the device itself, we can create a database, which the cool thing then is it can replicate and connect to a server if you want and then copy the data to the server. Because if we've got our project working on the device only and all your data is on the device, and then the device crashes or you drop it in the lake, well, you lost everything. One of the big draws, of course, of having your data on a server, your database on a server, is that it's in the cloud and you can retrieve it. PouchDB in this uh, style of databases can run on the device and then it can replicate to a server. Now, this is as much as I'll show for this. You can educate yourself on it a little bit more and then we will have a full lesson on this. But what I want to do for today is start to introduce the paradigm in how this all works. Looking at the code over here, this is going to work via JavaScript, JavaScript syntax, where most databases work with their own syntax, SQL syntax, SQL. You have to write uh, syntax in a certain way to create the database, to save data to the database, to retrieve it, to edit it. It's its own language, SQL, Structured Query Language. Uh, this is going, because it's a newer generation of type of database, it's like I said, no SQL. It often, this one especially, but these often run using the syntax of JavaScript. And what we understand about JavaScript of objects and methods. And this, even though maybe you've never heard of or seen uh, PouchDB before, this should look familiar-ish. This is JavaScript. A variable is created, an object, database. New instance of the PouchDB uh, with a name. We've got a db.put. We've got a db.changes. These are methods. Put data into the database. Check for changes in the database. Replicate the database to this server. So today we're going to spend time with the concept of this data right here. This is JSON formatted data, J-S-O-N. How many of you have heard of JSON before this class? Uh, about half or so good. So JSON, J-S-O-N, JavaScript object notation. It's a way to bundle data together in an, as an object of JavaScript in JavaScript format, JavaScript object notation. So this is saving to the database three fields, so to speak, an ID field, a name field, an age field. All of that is bundled together in these curly braces and then put into the database. 
So we're going to have a lesson today where we under, understand more, or we attempt to understand more JSON format, because this is the format that the data will be stored and retrieved in PouchDB, which is the one of the many NoSQL database implementations. So I have for us a uh, starting file in the network folder, a starting folder. If you go to the network folder, if you go to the network folder, you will see JSON practice start. Copy that whole folder to your desktop or your flash drive. I'm going to copy it to my flash drive, and I'm also going to put today's date on it. We should probably finish everything that I want to cover about this today, but if not, we will continue it next time. But I'm going to copy that to my flash drive, put today's date. That folder simply has a collection of nine pictures. You can change the view to show icons. So we're going to create a simple project where we are uh, dynamically retrieving the data of a social network. I have here nine social networks, uh, pictures of the icons of nine social networks. The end result, let me pull up the end result, the end result is that we're going to retrieve the data of this social network. Social network randomizer. So it starts off, it doesn't show anything, and then we'll have a button, random network. Click. It's going to say YouTube. Click. It's going to be Twitter. So it's going to show a picture, it's going to show text, and this text is going to be an active link to go to the website. Well, this is retrieving randomly from those nine pictures uh, some information. The picture, the text, you also have uh, about information, and then a link. So for Facebook, it's got the picture. You need to update that. But it's got about text. It's got a link, which is active, and it goes somewhere. This idea is that we're going to use JSON format to create a simple database of the social networks here. We have one piece of information for the network, just the picture. We need to save in the database uh, the name of the network, a little bit of an about blurb for the network, and an address to the network. And this is going to segue us later in part two when we do this for real in our, uh, in our uh, CBDB app. But I want to think about how we bundle this data together in JSON format, because JSON format is very popular. Many websites that you connect to nowadays to tap into their database will give you back information in JSON format. If I want to make a Twitter app, that connects to the Twitter uh, database to retrieve tweets. It's going to give it back to you uh, in JSON format. If I want to connect to um, you know, the Flickr website, which has millions, billions of photos, if I want to connect to it to retrieve the data, it's going to give it to me in this format. So then we're going to understand how does JSON format work, what does it look like, how do you use it. Let's first look at the website json, j-s-o-n, dot org. j-s-o-n, json, dot org. JSON is a lightweight data interchange format. It's easy for humans to read and write. It's easy for machines to parse and generate. It's based on a subset of JavaScript, 
Exma 262, third edition, December 99, etc. JSON is a text format that is completely language independent, but uses conventions that are familiar to programmers of the C family, including C, 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 Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Perl, Python, etc. These properties make JSON an ideal data interchange language. So basically, this is a way to describe data. A database is just it's just a thing that describes data. You might think, well, it's a place where I store my information. Sure, but a database holds information. Let's say I've got a database full of users. Let's say I build a social network. So I have to have a database of my users. A user is going to consist of a first name, a last name, a password, an email, a profile picture a biography, all of that information is, is tied together one to one user. And I've got two users, 200, 2,000, 2 million users, but all of that information of a user is tied together like in a bundle. JSON format will help us accomplish that for our purposes. The syntax is very straightforward to learn, and this is why it's very popular. So many websites use this because they'll kick back data to you in this format, and if you can read it, you can then do something with it. So this uh, flowchart here, we have an opening and, curl an open opening and closing curly brace. Then we have a string, colon, a value, optionally more data. So we have key and value pairs. JSON is built on two structures a collection of name or key value pairs. In various languages, this is realized as an object, a record, a struct, dictionary, hash table, whatever the language calls it. And it's an ordered list of values. This can be an array, a vector, a list, etc., a sequence. So basically, we're going to have something. Last name, colon, campus, comma. First name, colon, Victor, comma. Uh, username, colon, v compost. And all of that is bundled together as one object in curly braces. That's a little bundle of data there. We can get much more complex because let's say we have home address, the value of that field, so to speak, home address. Well, that's going to require street number, street, name, zip code, city, and all of that. So it's like four different pieces of data that are tied into one, one, uh, one key of address. So we can incorporate arrays. We can even put objects in objects. Um, JSON formatted data in JSON formatted data. So these are the val these are the these are the data types that could be the value. A simple string like quotes, Victor, a number, you know, one, two, three, an object with which, which we'll see that itself is uh, more data in the curly braces, and a, an array in square brackets, true, false, and null. Just a lot of detail, very technical. How does uh, how do uh, what kind of string? data can we have, and number data, and then a bunch of links to resources for you to learn more. Well, how does this work, or how do I use it in JavaScript? And there's going to be links there for you to go look on your own. But you see how all of these languages have a way to handle uh, JSON, because it's so ubiquitous now. To see this in action, Let's go ahead and open up Notepad++. Let's save your file as json1, json1, dot json, and save it in the same folder as the as those pictures, 
And on the save as type, I believe you have a JSON type as well. I think I remember that mine here in the instructor station doesn't have it, but I think you guys do uh, in your s at the bottom. So check on your types there. Um, yeah, mine doesn't have it, but you should see JSON, J-S-O-N, and also just simply call it as uh, json1.json. Right now the file is empty. Just create a new file and save it, json. or json1.json, save as type json. So a JSON file can only have JSON data. It cannot have comments. It cannot have the familiar JavaScript comments or the HTML comments. So if you start to write anything like, you know, double slash, this is JSON, no, it's not going to be uh, a valid JSON file. Um, there are ways to write comments, which I'll explain later. But basically, we have to have the opening and, clo and closing curly braces. So all of our data is going to be bundled in curly braces. And we're going to have, for example, like I was saying, double quotes. And technically, it has to be double quotes. Sometimes people use single quotes. It has to be double quotes. We can have last name. colon, your last name, for example, comma, quotes, first name, colon, your first name. So this is JSON format. You have to have some sort of like field name in quotes, colon, what is the value? Comma, say age, colon. That one would be a number. If I put it in quotes, it would be a string. It might not then do what I expect it to do as quotes. So there it would be as a number. And we would go on and on. And let's say that all encompasses one user. So then I could have another bundle, last name, colon, Smith, comma, first name, John, age 55. What we're going to write here is just going to be kind of to introduce this idea. It's not going to be valid code because I think it's more important to understand how this works and the, than to write it completely right for the moment. So what I mean is, just for readability, you can break this stuff also like this. I'm going to write the same thing but slightly different. do this if you want or not. But what I'm trying to do here is to show, because it's just plain text that is describing this data, this is another way to write the exact same thing on line one. I broke apart these curly braces so that I can read it like this. I tabbed so that these are all nice and lined up. And I have the data. Notice I have commas after each uh, field, after each key and value, after each name and value pair, except the last one. And like I said, there are no, you, you cannot use the usual uh, JavaScript comments, but this is not going to be a real, real JavaScript file, or JSON file, so I'm going to write comments here, but the notes are, this shouldn't have comments, so this is kind of superfluous. JSON files, only have JSON data. 
they should not have JavaScript comments. So this is wrong. You know, it is that we need the JSON data. You know, either all strung together like that, or separated like that with some spacing and making it look nice and so forth. You have name and value pairs separated by colons. Each pair by commas until the last one. The very last one should not have a comma. It's the end of the data. Last name, comma, first name, comma, age, no comma, the end. On the one hand, JSON is, is very straightforward. It's easily human readable, machine readable. But in order for it to be that, it has to be very strict. Because then we also have to say, yes? You, it, you typed up there, they should have JS comments. This is wrong. Did, did you mean they shouldn't have? Or? Sorry, yes, they should not have. Yes, should not have. Mm -hmm. um, name, uh, names should have double quotes, not single quotes. <coughs> so this official specification is kind of rigid. Uh, it has to have double quotes. No final comma there. Other languages or other schema uh, do change that up a little bit, but when, you know, when they invent the JSON format, they said, we're going to do it this way. Double quotes. No ending comma. White space is all right. Notice how I pressed enter and I pressed tab and all of that. That's fine. If yours is not different colors like this, you might have to go over to language and select JSON. Mine was just plain black and white. If it didn't change to some more, you know, readable colors, you can go up to language and select JSON. So you can kind of see it here. So you've got the, the symbols, curly braces, colons, strings, numbers. So if this defines one user, last name, first name, age, what I was saying earlier about um, a person's address. So if I were, get, were to add a new field, we would add a comma to the next, to add a, a next field. Here I could call it address. Notice I can use all lowercase, I can use intercaps or camel caps. That naming is fine. Lowercase, uppercases, etc. In this case, like I said, I want to save uh, all of the separate pieces of what makes up a person's address as one field. Here then I can get pretty complex. I can put an object in an object. So I can put curly braces here to now define another bundle of data. So here I would have street number colon 123 comma street address fake street pronounced fake street fake street and then the rest zip code city etc um, and I can break it up with uh, tabs and enters and all of that I am running out of space so I will do that um, I can put this all in one long line. Here's this. Uh, now, now this information is bundled into this field. 
the property, as we'll see in a moment, what I could do then is, like I said, okay, comma, enter to the next line, and then continue it. What else we have? Uh, uh, city. So we can do city. San Diego, comma, zip code. Zip code. Call in, that'll be a number. 92123. It's the last piece of data in this object, JSON object, so it does not have a comma. And here, I didn't put spaces between these. I could. I usually do for readability. I'm just showing you that you have just about any way to write it. All of these, you could have pressed enter and kept them all on their own line too. You don't have to do this, but you could have done this as well. Put all of these on their own line. And then tab them and align them and all that good stuff. I'm going to undo that in a moment, but you, can have done, you could have done that as well. That looks nice and readable. The computer can process this so quickly and it doesn't quite care if it's all on one long line or multiple lines, but for us that we need to read this, it might be better to break it up something like that. What's going to be tricky sometimes is keeping track of your opening and your curl and closing curly braces. Since you cannot write comments to remind yourself, this is the end of my object. This is the end of address. You know, that's a little bit of a tricky thing to keep track of that you'll need to do. Because I want to add one more field, one more field up on the higher level, which would be username. So I've got this comma right here. This comma represents a continuation of more data at this level. It was very easy to hear, here to see. We've got this field, comma, this one, comma, then this one. Then all of this is embedded or assigned or connected with this. And I want a new field, so that's a comma right there. But it's not the comma right at the end of that, because this is its own object. This is what I'm saying about be careful about this and pay attention to how it goes and you can't really write comments. You can kind of actually write comments by creating a field called comments. Following the JSON syntax. No final comma in an object. You can do it that way. You can create a field called comment and write your comment, but you can't use the symbols of a normal JavaScript comment. And yes, there are special characters and all of that that we have to deal with, apostrophes and so forth. Uh, we'll check the documentation on that a little later. But all of this is an object, JavaScript object notation. All of this is like a bundle of data, which then I would save to the database. All of that is grouped together as this one user. And I have this, this schema, this way of saving the data. I have these fields, last name, first name, age, address, username. And I would reuse those over and over for another person. John Smith, Janet Jones, etc. And I would fill in all of their data, and all of that's grouped together itself. This is the style of the NoSQL databases. There is a variation of this for the classic MySQL and Oracle and all of that, but this is the style of database we're going to use where it's, you know, very, I think, you know, it's raw data to look at to kind of understand. Behind the scenes it will be saving in a database which we can retrieve and edit uh, and, uh, and modify and replicate to a real server and all of that. Since this isn't real data just yet, you know, continuing over here, um, all of this backing up over here, db equals, all of that would be in the database. The whole database can be, the whole database or portions of the database that we parse 
can be represented as that one object in JavaScript, var. So all of that data can then be as one object that we work with in JavaScript. Because then we will see when we do this for real with the example stuff I've given you, we would be able to do something uh, with real JavaScript uh, to say like console.log <coughs> db. And in the console, it would show you all the data, all of those fields, all of that data. Well, I only want to retrieve a last name db dot last name. I have this property of this object. So when it's the raw JSON data, we have certain kind of syntax, a name and a value pair. When we're using it in JavaScript, well, it's an object of data uh, with a last name of property, that last name. Yes. So then in the case of address, it'd be db.address.streetNumber? Mm -hmm. Exactly. We would simply go to the next deeper level, and that would kick back one, two, three. So the top level object, it's property, sub-property, sub-property, and then that value comes out in the console. Oh, sorry. No. Good point. So because we're trying to get down to address, we wouldn't, li we wouldn't list last name. We get to the database top level, then we go down to the address sub level, then we go to the street number sub sub level, and then we get the, the data. One, two, three. So db dot username would be a sim simple retrieval, then deeper down there. If we wanted to kind of do the opposite, this is retrieving data. If we wanted to save data, we do something like db.age equal to 40. So assignment operator um, putting data. Now, this is like the high level of how it would work, you may say, okay, well, this applies to one user. What if I've got 70 users? Let me rewrite it a little bit over here. rdb2 is equal to JSON. We would have use, oops, in quotes, users. And then the JSON object. You have a field that lists all the users. We would have the we would have a field that lists all the users. All the data here. For the moment, let me just do it like this: xxx semicolon. And I want uh, admins. Y y y. So we can have like a huge table, sort of, of users, admins. But what's going to happen inside of here, we saw at json.org, we can put very simple string data, right? Last name is Campos. I started to show address is all of this info. Using arrays, starting with an array here, we can have object, comma, object, comma, object, comma, infinity. So what would, what would be this object would be Campos. And what, would, and what this object would be would be Smith. And the next one, Jones. So imagine all of this is here. So I copied and pasted.
from the exercise of example a moment ago. Um, first user, Campos, in the regular users table, comma, second user, which will have last name, first name, age, address, username, comma, third user, two millionth user. And the way we would retrieve this data, because now we're using arrays, is we have to use the array syntax, or the, the, array, in, the array index. So it would be something like console log db2 dot users brackets for the array the first user is zero we start counting with zero in the array then the dot last name and that would retrieve campos or address dot street number and we'll do city Because users is storing, in this case, four users, zero, one, two, three. And so you give me the city of the zero with, the first user. If I wanted the uh, zip code of the third user, zero, one, two, the third user is going to be a two. So I would say, in the second database, in the users table, the uh, index two, the third user, uh, address zip code. So now it's it's uh, a particular a particular user in the in the collection of, of data. Of users, and I would have something very similar on admins. Whatever structure or syntax, maybe for the admins, the only thing I need to save is is username uh, and last name. I can define how that's going to look, however I want, and then I can retrieve it. This is one of the reasons. Also, this is popular. You can design what are the fields, what's your schema, what's your What's your way of saving your data? What makes sense to you for your purposes? And then we can uh, pull the data if we have the syntax. And this is this is JavaScript syntax. We've got an object with a property, sub-property, etc. This is more complex because now we're dealing with an array with with uh, index values of an array, sequential values, one is the second user, and then we can retrieve its particular data. <clears throat> so all of this that we're looking here is conceptual. The general idea of the, the way we write it, the syntax, etc. Um, the way we will do this, the way we'll make this work with what I've given us, well, as I said, we're, we're going to create a database, a simple database of a social network. It's going to have the name of the social network, uh, a little description of the social network, an address to it, and a picture. Well, so far what I've been saving here has been text information. But what if, under users, we also have a field. Now, obviously, here the comma is outside of the quotes. This is not like a regular sentence in English. I would not put the comma inside of the quote, like a real English sentence. That would break the syntax. It's got to be outside, because you've got a string, comma, more stuff. What if we have here icon? Right, the person's icon in the social network. So. This data here can be two ways. You could have the raw data that makes up a photo, because a photo can be represented with ones and zeros and numbers and, you know, code. Or a photo can be represented as a location on a server.
So you could have the data stuffed into the database itself if it's in the right format, in like raw data. That's not what you want to do. You don't want to have that blob of data. That's going to make your database even bigger. Most databases really only store text. So even with you know 10,000 users, the database itself might only be two megabytes. It's just text or numbers. And those pictures, yeah, I took a really amazing selfie and it was in my 20 megapixel camera, but those 20 megapixels of data are not being stored right in the database. It's just a reference to the data somewhere. So, you know, whatever path, if, if we have a relative path in, in the server, this would work like that. But that's a path over to the icon of the user. And so if I wanted to display you know, the, in theory, if I wanted to display this in, in the code, it could be something like, you know, image source equals to db2.users, the zero with user dot uh, icon. Right? Because that's expecting something.jpg. Yeah, that's pointing to something.jpg in our database. And it actually displays it as a picture on and on screen. Some of this is pseudo code. It's not real, real, real code until we do it. It'll be the real code, but it's helpful to kind of put it together like this as one file to kind of get the idea of it. Here's the syntax of it. Here's how we might retrieve it. Here's how we might use it. Let's take a quick look at one more thing online, then we'll take a little break. Let's see what's it called. Uh, Marvel Comics API, I think. Let me look here. So Marvel Comics, developer.marvel.com. Um, we will see this later. We've got developer.android.com, developer.apple.com, developer.windows.com, developer.chrome.com. You know, this is a standard convention nowadays that all of these, you know, tech companies have a developer's portal. Marvel Comics has one as well. A couple of years ago, they opened up their database of, you know, 70 years of comics for us to be able to tap into that database to pull data out of it. Well, what was that issue where the first appearance of Spider-Man or whatever? Or uh, what's the uh, comic where uh, Stan Lee wrote that issue, etc.? So we can tap into their huge database and guess what? It's going to give it back to us in JSON format. So if we understand what we're looking at, we can write JavaScript to then process that, parse that, and put it into our project, our website, or our app. Let's see if we can see an example. Test calls. Let's see. Fetch a list of characters. If you want to take a quick look here, okay, you can look at Get Started. Oh, not there. Uh, right here. Uh, test calls. Use the interactive test page to explore the test API calls. So you hear that keyword a lot. API. Um, application programming interface. Which is how do we interface? How do we connect to the application? The application is a database of 70 years worth of comics. I want to retrieve data of characters. So to speak, there is sort of a database that includes all the characters, all of their comics. This will give us the examples of how to, how to talk to it. But you would be getting back data, again, in JSON format, character data wrapper. Uh, you'd get back, for example, a status, colon, a string description of the call status, its copyright, the actual data, data, character data container, character mm -hmm. ID. So again, this is in JSON format, and Marvel here is saying, we're using this format. You can make an app that interfaces with our database. This is how our database talks. And JSON format is not that complex to understand at first glance. There, there is the rigidity of the uh, syntax. And then to do something with it, yeah, that's the part that's much more complex. You can see examples over here. We'll 
what's uh, well, how do we how exactly in JavaScript do I uh, do I write it so that it randomly my app will and it will randomly retrieve a brand new Marvel comics every day? How do I write an app that it, when the person turns on their phone it'll automatically have the comic of the day? That's not what it's actually going to you know teach you, but it's going to tell you here's how you get into our data. Then you need to know how to write the JavaScript and the HTML to display it. This is one example off the top of my head. There's a lot of other ones. We can go look over for the, um, the way Twitter does it, and Facebook, and all of them have developer.facebook.com. Uh, how do I create a Facebook app to tap into the Facebook database and pull data, or save data, or make my own Facebook app? And there's going to be the documentation. So for example, it's documenting what the different fields are, the different possibilities are. Then further down, you say, okay, let's retrieve something. Here it is in JSON format. Let's retrieve a title field of the Spider-Man. And then way down here, it says, okay, here's your data. Not very impressive just yet, because I need an API key. I need a developer's credential uh, that shows, you know, I'm a developer, here's my app, um, give me the right data. If I fully set it up, create a free account and all of that, and set it up the right way, it would then kick back a list of issues where Spider-Man has been in. But again, the data comes back in JSON format. Curly braces, there's a date field, quotes, colon, there's a Greenwich Mean Time timestamp, content type, it's in JSON format, and we would have something, you know, real data coming back to us. With that real data, then we will process it, and that's what we're going to do with this activity after the break. We're going to click a button to randomly pick one of the items in the database to display on screen. So if we can create this database, how do we actually put it on screen? Via JavaScript, we'll process it and display it on screen. General questions on, on this? We'll do it for real right after the break. So it's 7 oh, Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to read the documentation, but that's true. A lot of these sites, you know, they don't let you connect to it a thousand times an hour or whatever. You have a limitation. Depending on the documentation and the little contract that we all agree to when we sign up, it's going to say if you can store the data for yourself offline, yes or no, or for how long. So it's, that's going to be an answer that by case-by-case -case basis, what does the developer portal let you do? So if it lets us store it for, you know, 24 hours, that might be all that I need it for, or seven days, or something. It's going to depend. Okay, let's uh, take a break at 7.12. We'll be back, uh, 7.02, let's take a break at 7.12. Yes, I'll be with you one moment. <laughs> 